Dolls, bicycles, skateboards, games, toys, and computers. Computers have become just one more item on the shelves of mass merchandisers like this Toys R Us store here in Redwood City, California. And while Coleco, Mattel, TI, and Sinclair are all gone now, Commodore and Atari are still battling it out in the low-cost computer wars. Today, we take a look at the so-called low-end computers on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. And Gary, this little Commodore VIC-20 really got the low-cost computer business started with people able to go out and buy a small computer for just a few hundred dollars. And I think we tend to forget, as we talk about IBM and Apple all the time, that there are more little Commodores out there than anything else. But Commodore and Atari, we know, are coming out with more sophisticated computers now. Is, in fact, that line disappearing between the so-called low-end computer and the mid-range guys like Apple? Well, Stuart, as you're aware, the low end means the home market, and that means TV pricing. And the consumers nowadays expect an awful lot more than they did a couple of years ago. And many of them were burned by what now turns out to be an expensive doorstop for them. <laughs> so success at the low end means that we're going to see very sophisticated hardware and software systems that are going to put an awful lot of pressure on the mid-range mach machines. And when we talk about the low end today, that really means Commodore and Atari. And when we talk about Commodore and Atari, that means Jack Tremiel, the king of the low-cost computers. We'll get to meet Jack and talk to him and his son and find out what's happening at the new Atari. We'll go back to Pennsylvania and find out what's going on at the new Commodore. But first of all, these computers may be inexpensive, but they do do some nifty things. Let's take a look. A few years ago, the low-end computer was promoted more for its price than its flexibility, more for entertainment than as a serious tool. But many owners of $2,000 computers might be surprised to see the inventive ways in which these inexpensive machines are used today. This Commodore 64 has taken its place alongside more traditional instruments in a music studio in San Francisco. It supports a group of musicians and composers who base their work on an unconventional tuning system called Just Intonation. Unlike the traditional 12-tone scale, just intonation requires the retuning of musical instruments to fit new, simple ratio intervals. The computer can overcome this time-consuming task since it will generate a piece of music from its mathematical description. Like a human singer, there is no limit to its tonal variations, and retuning a program is much easier than retuning a piano. While the sound quality restricts the machine's performance abilities, the computer's role is more as a sketch pad to test new ideas, provide the background sound, and as a reference for tuning other instruments. Another clever application makes use of a typical low-priced computer's strong point, graphics. With a digitizing pad and a color plotter, this user has painstakingly created a library of city maps showing the location of projected buildings and their shadows, traffic congestion, and land usage. Since the printout is on transparent plastic, he can highlight certain aspects of each map and study them together in overlay. While not every computer owner may want his machine to create unorthodox music or to draw detailed maps, the potential uses of a discount store special should not be underestimated. It is no longer a toy. Joining us now is Leonard Trammell. Leonard is Vice President for Software Development at Atari, and next to Leonard, his father, Jack Trammell, Jack Chairman and CEO of Atari, and formerly the President of Commodore. 
Jack, you were you were Commodore. Yeah. You uh, a very important part of Commodore, obviously, several years ago when the low-cost calculator, 995 calculator, was introduced. What is your uh, ideas? What is your idea about marketing low-cost devices? Well, my idea is always to try to bring the best technology uh, at the lowest price to the masses. Mm -hmm. We are a company which we like to sell to the masses, not to the classes. <laughs> okay. Well, this, this particular uh, new introduction of the machine is, is a threatened, uh, I guess it threatens the mid-range computers, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, this particular machine, the 520ST, is an $800 machine, if I understand it correctly. Yes. It's a half a mega memory, a 68K processor, and a monochrome display. Now, that price point must have been a very difficult one to hit. How do you do that? Well, I mean, there's no question that it is always hard to come up with a new product. Uh, but knowing and understanding uh, the semiconductor business and knowing where the costs are going, you can always foresee uh, what you're going to be able to come out with. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, with no question, uh, it is feasible at the present time. Uh, to give you an idea, when we started developing this particular product, a uh, 256K RAM uh, used to cost $30. Today it's down to 4 <laughs> So you only have to have a crystal ball and to be able to see it, what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, we have that particular crystal ball. Now, how much, uh, how, how much of an advantage do you have? Do you, do you build this offshore, or is it built to the U.S.? Where is it? No, we do definitely have uh, in Atari. Uh, Atari has a uh, very large assembly plant in Taiwan, mm -hmm. and we are continuing assembling in Taiwan. But the parts, uh, most of them, come from the United States. They're shipped to Taiwan for assembly. So uh, more than 75 percent in this product is American made. Mm -hmm. Give us an idea, Jack, of the cost in terms of figuring out what it costs to make that computer. How much does it cost, in fact, to put it together compared to how much does it cost to buy the parts? Uh, I would say that the assembly of the computer is about 2% of the cost. So, I mean, it's just a couple of bucks, basically, to build that computer. Well, it's more than a couple of bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you mentioned before you've had the unique ability to have this crystal ball and kind of guess at where prices are going. Has that been the difference? I mean, what happened to Coleco and TI and so on? Well, uh, I believe when it comes to Coleco, Coleco definitely uh, is a toy maker and they're very successful of manufacturing toys. And they were trying to apply the same technique into computers and it didn't work because it was like a toy. And they failed. Was this basically where they were selling the machines? Or you're selling, for example, in the, uh, the Kmart, so for exa example, is that, is that a good place to sell computer systems or is it a good place to sell toys? I believe uh, that uh, Kmart is selling uh, video uh, and, uh, sound systems for two, three thousand dollars. So uh, today Kmart is a department store which sells everything. Mm -hmm. And I believe that our customer is sophisticated enough that he knows the value, what he's getting, and he will try to get the best price at any retailer. Now, let's take, let's take for example, uh, what we call, let's say, the mid-range machines, or the more expensive machines um, that are being put into the office uh, environment right now. Now, how are, how are the, let's say, the 520ST is going to get into business if they're, say, sold through the Kmart? Do you see that happening, first of all, or do you see this being targeted at, a, at as a home market machine, mostly? No, we, uh, in Atari, uh, believe very much that we are manufacturing products for personal use. We call it personal computers. When I started the personal computer business in 1976, we call it a personal computer, and I'm still continuing. Now, it's up to the individual where he wants to carry this computer to. Mm -hmm. He can have it mm -hmm. in his home, and he can have it in his office, he can have it in the lab, anywhere. But it's up to him. I do not dictate to him where he's going to take it to. Gary, we've been talking about the ST, and I know everybody's excited about the ST. I'd like to turn to Leonard, and Leonard, describe the, the new computer and give us a little bit of what it does. Well, the description Gary gave a moment ago, it's a, a half a megabyte, 68,000 based processor. Uh, the unique things about the machine are the high resolution color graphics. We're looking now at the 640 by 200 display and a familiar looking uh, <laughs> opening screen where you have uh, a window which you can resize and move around and various files that happen to be on this disk and you can take the icons and move them around and access a disk drive 
uh, in a, a manner which should be familiar to uh, sophisticated users by now and hopefully will be, uh, will be familiar to other people in a very short length of time. So as, as a practical matter, Leonard, as you suggest, when we look at this, this looks more or less, if you'll allow me, like a color Macintosh and essentially a color Fat Mac with the, with the 512K, right? Yes. And, and, and what price is this going to be sold at? Well, this with a monochrome display instead of this color uh, and one disk drive will be about $800. Okay, how do you see the software, uh, the evolution of the software? This, this could be, if this was a big thing, for example, how many, how many of these do you think you're going to sell, just as a, a rough guess? Well, uh, the market definitely this year is softer than it was last year, mm -hmm. but we still believe that we'll be able to sell more than a million of those computers this okay. year. Okay. Now, if you sell numbers like that, that's going to obviously be a very important place for, for software vendors to sell their software. Uh, how do you see that whole software evolution taking place in terms of... Uh, uh, let's say the, the, the low-cost computers. Well, uh, in the company which uh, I founded uh, and I was working previously in, uh, when I came out with the Commodore 64 and there was no software, everybody was telling me how difficult it will be to sell a computer which has no software. Mm -hmm. Even at $199. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> and there's no question that the majority of third-party software people has seen the value in the computer and they've also seen that people are going to buy them and uh, during uh, the time when I was there, before I left, we were uh, selling as many as 300,000 computers a month. And with no question that Commodore today has a, one of the biggest libraries of software available. Now the, the, but the Commodore 64, the C64, did take some time before that software really uh, started to appear on the market. It, it must have been uh, a, year guess, and a, half. a year and a half. Okay. Right. Now, is there, is there any way that you see that that, could, that can be... Uh, accelerated, say, with the 520, or is it just going to be a natural phenomenon? People no. are interested in the Mac-like interface, and as a result, we're going to see... I believe it's going to be faster because there are definitely many, many more software, uh, third-party software mm -hmm. houses out there. And there's quite a bit of software being written at the present time for the Mac. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, it's, it's quite easy to port over the software to our machine. And I believe it will not take 80 months. It will take quite a bit faster. But we, when we come out, when we will introduce the machine and start selling the product, we will have between 25 and 30 major pieces of software with it. Jack, what, who do you see as your competition? Is it Apple? Is it the new machine out of Commodore? This, to, to me, it's uh, everybody's competition, but specifically for the ST line, uh, it is Apple today. Uh, the Commodore machine I did not see yet, so I cannot um, uh, say anything about it yet. How about the Japanese? As far as the Japanese is concerned, I, I was uh, able to keep those people out uh, of the U.S. market and almost from the world market for the past seven years. And I really do not see them coming in. They didn't even come into the 8-bit line. Uh, I do not know how they're going to be able to come into the 16-bit. Uh, the Japanese are known to be able to be a very strong competitors almost in every field, especially in electronics. And the reason why they were able to compete because the manufacturers, like the automobiles and, and other electronic manufacturers, were making very substantial, very substantial profits. And that gave them an opportunity to come in here, reduce the price, come out with very good quality, and the world market that the American public bought it. What I'm trying to do is to come out with the best product, with the best quality, and also with the best price. And by doing so, I keep those people out. Mm -hmm. And thanks God, well, it's successful so far. Well, the uh, C64 was was uh, definitely um, one of those devices that kept uh, the Japanese machines out. No question about that. Okay, John, we're going to have to take <coughs> a short break. We're going to be back with Jack and Leonard Trammell in just a moment. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to go to Westchester, Pennsylvania, and see what's been happening happening at Commodore in the post Trammell era. So stay with us. The company which put more personal computers into more homes than anyone else is Commodore, located not in the Silicon Valley, but here in Westchester, Pennsylvania, outside Philadelphia, where the money was, says Jack Trammell. But Trammell is gone now, not only gone, but heading up the forces of competitor Atari. And with personal computer sales leveling off, the pressure is on Commodore to come up with something new. Trying to anticipate what the consumers will need next year, they've come up with a product like the 128, which has twice the capacity and the features that the uh, 64 has, although totally compatible. Uh, and yet, 
has the flexibility of dealing with more productivity type of, of applications. Commodore's newest computer is a machine of many faces operating in three different modes. It offers 128K of memory but is compatible with the old 64. It can jump between an 80 column and 40 column screen and in its top mode it'll run CPM. With the 128's expandable memory, numeric keypad and extended basic, Commodore seems to be aiming for a new segment of the market. Today the product, quite honestly, is equal to the Apple IIc. It has all the features and functions that the Apple IIc has, and because of our high volume mass production capabilities, we're able to uh, afford a reasonable margin that the Apple product affords, and yet offer the consumer half the price point. If Commodore is able to lure away potential Apple buyers, it will mark a new kind of push into the already shaky PC market. But the company, once associated with action games and entry-level computers, has loftier goals, and they include the very secret of project called Amiga. The Amiga product has tremendous flexibility and capabilities in the graphics environment, in the telecommunications, as well as uh, trying to focus in on higher education and higher end home. I don't call it a product that will be used exclusively to replace IBM productivity in the office environment or the Fortune 500 or the Fortune 5000. I do call it a, an extremely flexible product that can be used with graphics, animation, and quite honestly, graphics and animation are the next big development in the personal computer business. Using maps, using uh, illustrations, using home banking, shopping by telecommunications and video text, that type of, of media. Timing-wise, uh, we're after, a year after the Macintosh, but quite honestly, when they look at the speed and the architecture of the Amiga compared to the speed and the architecture of the Macintosh, there's no comparison. To some industry observers, the decision to enter the mainstream of the PC market may seem like a risky venture. But Commodore is so confident about its new products, it will soon introduce a third new computer, the LCD Portable with eight built-in programs, a modem 32K of RAM, and a 16 by 80 column screen. The price has not been set, but it will be extremely competitive. Despite industry problems elsewhere, Commodore is not worried about the leveling off of PC sales. I don't believe we've tapped more than 15% of the market in microcomputers, personal computers, home computers, whatever. We think we've captured the mass market. We think we own, we are kings of the mass merchandisers. We don't believe there are any other viable competitors there. We're now looking onward to opening up other channels to strengthen our uh, market position and to try to capture more share in the long haul. One problem with buying a Commodore 64 or any low-cost computer is the lack of support. You usually buy it at a discount house where the salesperson, if there is a salesperson, probably knows less about computers than you do. The solution for most low-end users is a user's group. Robin Garthwaite has more on that. Computer Chronicles went to the Marin Commodore Computer Club. That the MCCC which means MC cubed, which is going Einstein one better. He only went MC squared. We found that when it comes to computers, Commodore or others, everyone has a common. I use it for a business tool. I've written software for the Santa Fe High School District. That they use it, and it's a multi-use computer. Everyone has an opinion. Apple computers are very low powered and very highly priced. And yeah. that's true of all Apple products. For example, when you buy the Commodore, the book that comes with it is really bad. Um, across the hall um, are sort of like the, the neophytes, which are like um, twice as old as we are. Everyone has a need. And then sometimes when we write programs and we have questions on the programs, we can um, bring the software in and have some people help us on it. But I want to know what the computer can do for me right away now. So coming to a user's group is very helpful for that because there are people here who can answer your questions. And everyone has a loyalty. I didn't know what I was going to do with it, and I didn't have it more than a few weeks, and I was hooked. The loyalty to computers is clear. Users groups like this have the potential to have a huge impact on the microcomputer industry. Toys or computers? It's a moot point. This is Robin Garthwaite for the Computer Chronicles. 
Stewart users groups are where a lot of the grassroots computing is, is it actually takes place. And a lot of times people think that uh, uh, the users groups are going to accept less qualities in their software. Uh, it, this is a phenomenon that happened around the Commodore 64, I believe, is the, that really there was an acceptance of a lower quality software. Uh, do you think this is really true nowadays? Can you sell a computer into the home jack and have it really, uh, you know, low quality software or is it going to have to all be really good stuff? I believe it have to be all good stuff. I mean, the, the, the consumer is more sophisticated. He's seen more. He understands more. He uh, almost has graduated. Uh, there's mm -hmm. quite a few people now which uh, have computers in their hands for the past eight years. I'm talking about low-end computers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are demanding more. Jack, where are you going to sell this? You know, there was criticism at the Commodore about uh, going out of the computer retailers and into the Toys R Us and Kmart and so on. This is a, a, a sophisticated machine. What's your plan for retailing? My answer to your question always is, whoever has money <laughs> will be able to sell it, whoever can pay for it. But uh, the truth is that I am looking for a very broad distribution. The uh, computer retailer uh, definitely uh, serves uh, a certain purpose. Uh, he holds hands with people, with business people and others which do not know how to operate a computer. We are selling this computer to people which have knowledge. We are selling it to the youth, to the people, to the kids from the age of 6 to 26, which were trained in school. They've learned computing. It is not strange to them. They know more about computers than the clerk which sells it to them. So for their reason, that can be sold almost anywhere. And I'm looking to sell it through mass market or anybody else which wishes to pay for it. Now, how about, uh, how about training programs? This is a point you brought up. If you're going to sell through the Kmarts and so forth, you, uh, I don't know what, ex what experience you had with the C64, but uh, are you, are you going to have special programs for the people that are actually selling the machine? We will have programs not only for the people which are selling the machine, but for the people which are buying the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope to be able to have programs right on the disk, which they're going to be able to read off this particular new ST model, which is going to be very easy for them. The whole intention of coming out with the ST line was to make it a more powerful and a easier, a simpler machine to use. By having in this computer can actually teach the owner how it should be used. Okay, now this, this is a good point because you're, now if you're, gonna, you're, you're obviously targeting then, let's say, into the home market with a, with a, a training program of that sort. What do you see as being really uh, specifically different about a home computing than, let's say, a business-oriented computer? How, how can you make it successful in the home where, let's say, um, uh, some other attempts have not been successful? Uh, this, this particular product, in my opinion, is a stronger product than the present IBM PC which is being used in offices. Mm -hmm. So I believe by giving this computer into the hands of the youth, those are the kids which are growing up and going to be in the offices in the, of the future. And if they can learn how to use it at home, right, they're mm -hmm. going to be buying it in the future. In the so office. do you see it as, as uh, some, of these, some of the directions that may be important is uh, around uh, educational use, for example? With no question. Mm -hmm. uh, education is going to be very important. We're going to have a number of different programs to the schools uh, starting almost immediately because we are now telling and we will be telling the public in the educators that this is a fourth generation computer now it was beautiful to have the commodore the pet and the 64 and the apple II, but the st is the future in the computing business and it's important to teach the kids t on today's computers not on yesterday's computers gentlemen we're out of time thanks very much for being here with us now in the computer wars we've got commodore and atari left our commentator, Paul Schindler, looks into his crystal ball to see who the winner will be in the end. Want to see a quick change? And if you think that was something, keep your eye on Atari. This company has the potential to be the most exciting thing that's happened to the computer market since the Apple Macintosh. People who thrilled to the exploits of Ted Turner, the mouth of the South, now have the chance to relive that thrill as they listen to Jack Tramiel promoting the new Atari. The man who revolutionized the home computer when he was at Commodore is going to do the same thing to the office. Things have been kind of calm in the office since the IBM PC came in. IBM set the price performance standard, what the Pentagon calls bang for the buck. Well, Atari is set to upset everyone's apple cart with more bang for less buck than has ever been seen in a serious business computer. And the word is that once they've blasted the office market, the home market's going to be next. The sad thing is that IBM is the company that deserves to have its cart upset, but it's Apple that's most likely to be hurt by Atari. 
Why is it always the case that the little guys end up battling each other while the big guys stand around and pick up the pieces? It wouldn't be that way if I ran the world, but I don't yet. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, you may have finished your income tax returns, but the Fed may be a little late in getting you your refund, due, of course, to computer problems. The IRS has a new $100 million computer system, but there are problems in the software. So the Feds are about 10 million refunds behind schedule. But don't worry, if you don't get your refund by June, the government has to start paying you interest. New Jersey's Department of Criminal Justice is using computers to help track down welfare abuse, and the computer has been a resounding success there. Convictions for welfare fraud have tripled since the computer system was put into use, and the state has recovered an additional $4 million. In Reading, Pennsylvania, food stamps have been replaced by computerized credit cards. In an experimental program, the Agriculture Department is giving former food stamp recipients new plastic cards. Each recipient is allotted a monthly balance, and each time the user visits the grocery store, the card is inserted into a machine, and the cost of the food is automatically deducted from the person's account. The Ag Department says the new computerized system could save the government hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Another major step in the continuing realignment of the software business, once proud Software Arts, the developer of VisiCalc, has agreed to be acquired by Lotus, both companies based in Massachusetts. Several major computer conferences over the past few weeks, the old-timer, the West Coast Computer Fair, had nearly 50,000 attendees. Most talked about probably some software called Voice Master. You sing into it, and it writes the musical notation. Atlanta was the site for SoftCon, the annual software show. Everybody looking for the new Lotus, the new trend in software, the consensus, AI, and expert systems, if somebody can figure out how to make one that's practical and easy to use. And the first Comdex in Japan is history. Sony showed off its new LaserDisc CD-ROMs, including a write-once disc system. Another highlight was software on a credit card, ROM chips, embedded in a plastic card so you can carry around a whole box of business software in your wallet. Speaking of software, here's Paul again with this week's review. Get a load of this sexy continental packaging. You know, when I first saw this program, I thought it was a Ferrari simulation. Now, it turns out it doesn't even come from Europe. It comes from Toronto, Canada. The program is Ability, the simplest of the integrated software packages yet offered. You know, get a load of this slim documentation. Most other integrated packages couldn't catch their breath in this documentation this slim. I've got to thank the people at Zanaro Technologies for their good sense. The software is not copy protected. They trust you while reducing your risk of loss and making it easier to use the package on a hard disk. Good for them. Now, the screens. Note the use of color. We can't show you everything Ability does, so we'll take a moment to show you its snapshot facility, which allows you to assemble graphics into a slideshow. You have a choice of adding text in different type styles, varying the amount of time used on each graphic, or adding arrows and lightning bolts. The graphics are, frankly, nitwit simple. You can do more with other packages, but not as fast. Sonaro Technologies of Toronto charges $495 for this combination word processor, database manager, graphics, spreadsheet, and communications. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Some vaporware updates. Lotus's Jazz, originally due out now, has been promised for the end of May. And Atari's ST computers, originally due out this month, are now being promised for summertime. How much does a computer really cost? A just-completed study says that the average IBM PC owner buys over $1,300 worth of software in the first year of owning a computer. At the low end, a New York market research firm says that one and a half million low-cost computers will be thrown in the trash this year. Another hotel chain is providing computers in rooms. The Holiday Inn Crown Plaza chain is putting AT&T 6300s in 10 of its hotels the charge 30 bucks a day. Another software company dumping copy protection. Too many complaints from users. Stoneware says DB Master will no longer be copy protected. Finally, pity the poor Macintosh workers at Apple. In the heyday, one Benny for the Mac team was company paid for massages at your workstation. They were called stress reduction treatments. But with a little pain in the muscle of Macintosh sales, Steve says no more back rubs. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.